Hello, welcome. This is Dr. Hisham Said. In this lesson, we'll learn about uh, how to accelerate uh, project schedules, and we'll do that considering uh, that time that there is a time cost relationship or trade off uh, when we change the duration of the, uh, the project. Um, so, these are the four uh, lesson objectives or learning objectives of this um, lesson. We'll learn about the need to reduce the project uh, duration, uh, kind of identify and compare between the different ways of crashing or shortening the project duration. And then we'll explain the relationship between time and cost, uh, in both in the activity level and the project level, and produce crash construction co uh, schedules, uh, see the procedure and the methodology of, of this activity here or task. Uh, so there are different needs for uh, reducing the project duration. Uh, one is uh, directed changes. Uh, so this is kind of a contractual language mentioned in the typical uh, construction project contracts. So directed changes means that the owner would like to change the uh, agreed upon uh, schedule duration of the project and they direct the uh, contractor or the builder to finish the project faster. Um, another reason is the uh, it's now an issue uh, or from the contractor side that they did something wrong or did not expect such uh, side conditions that reduce the productivity. So they would like to crash the schedule or accelerate the schedule um, to compensate for lost time that they had, and that will help them to avoid penalties or what we call liquidated damages that the owner would would, would typically require in, in project contracts. Uh, and then another reason is to free resources that you can move from this project to another project that is uh, is behind schedule. So if you have a heavy crane that is committed to this project and you need it to another project, then you, you want to uh, accelerate the activity uh, or activities before using this crane or the activities dependent on this crane. So you, once it's done, the crane is free to move to the following project. Uh, and then other reasons is like you need to uh, expect that the, uh, a storm is coming or, or the weather is uh, worse than you expected. Then you try to achieve as much work as you can. And then the last thing is you achieve the optimal project duration to account for the time cost trade-off, which is a relationship we'll learn about soon. So there, there are three ways of how you can reduce the project duration or accelerate the project schedule. Um, the first one, sequence change, and then subcontracting, and then how to you crash the activities themselves. Um, there is no kind of best recipe for uh, all projects. Every project is different. Uh, every project you might apply only one or all of these approaches. Uh, so you have to be really innovative about how to reduce the project schedule in, in, in every project considering its unique conditions. And this is how you would shine as a, as a project manager, as, as how to find solutions to problems that you have. So let's, uh, let's see here each one of these approaches. So the first one is changing the uh, schedule uh, sequence. Uh, let's see this example here. So we have um, this abutment. So you have here, you see there's the, this kind of a, um, a, a channel. Um, so you want to have a bridge on top of it. Uh, or maybe this is a highway or a road uh, or a culvert. So you want to have a, a road above it. So you are building abutment here and maybe another abutment on the other side. Um, and then you will have the deck. Uh, on top of this, and then you will backfill this this area here. So this is the abutment wall, and this is the footing. So here you're done with the footing. So you're done with the formwork of the footing, the rebar of it, pouring the concrete, and then stripping the formwork. And then you're you're working on the abutment uh, itself, or the wall of the abutment. So you fabricate and deliver the abutment deck rebar. Uh, so that's kind of the Offside kind of stuff that happens before you form uh, the abutment and then uh, in, in, uh, install the rebar as one activity. 
uh, other ways you can. Uh, I will not say that. So we'll, we'll st I will stay quiet until asking the real question here. Uh, and then once you're done with the formwork at rebar, you pour similar to the footing. You pour the concrete, and then I'm not showing here, but you st strip the the formwork that you put for the abutment. And then after that, you will do the deck. So I'm only focusing on that part. The, you're done with the footing and you're planning to do the abutment, which requires four more rebar and pouring the concrete. Question is, you're now running out of time and you want to achieve things a little faster. So pause here a little. Think about what are the ways uh, that you can accelerate the schedule by changing some sequence um, to, to save some time in the schedule. So I'll show the answer, but I want you to pause and really think about what would be a possible way to do that. So uh, let's think about one possible way. I mean, there are many, many possible solutions. There is no one single correct solution here. Uh, but the one way that can be possible to do is um, the formwork and rebar is bundle, bundled in one activity. And if you look here in the picture, the formwork of one side of the abutment is, is put in place, and then you put the rebar, right? Um, so you don't have to uh, waste time here by putting, uh, or, or you don't have to wait until the, the rebar to come to fabricate or install the formwork of uh, one side of the abutment. So this is what's happening here, is that you're splitting this activity because it's now on the critical path, all of it. So why not split it, move one part of it into a non-critical uh, path and, and, and this is what's happening here, is that you're installing the outside form uh, or face of the abutment until the rebar comes and then when the rebar comes you will install the rebar and the inside form. So kind of you close the form. So that will save you time. Why not, why you're holding yourself and starting the formwork to wait for the rebar to come. You can actually start some of the formwork and this is how you can do things. You can split the activities instead of bundling, bundling them into one big activity. And this is typically a strategy is uh, plan in more um, detailed ways so you can move pieces around. Uh, also another way is, is probably this is a very long activity because you're fabricating and delivering both the abutment and the dig rebar. So you're uh, shop drawing and fabricating the rebar of both the deck, which is the, the, the horizontal part of the, of the bridge, and then the, the abutment. But if you think about it, there is no much dependency between both. Structurally, in most cases, there is no much dependency. So why you put them in one uh, submittal package and review package. Uh, of course, it's better for the architect to review everything at once, but sometimes a necessity here, uh, you know, drives towards splitting that into pa two packages so you don't hold the rebar of the abutment uh, review to review the, the deck rebar because that, the deck will be built in the future and the first thing we have to deal with is the abutment. So there's you can create a parallel channel here, so you can split this to, into two activities, and probably they will be shorter, so you will squeeze more the schedule. So now you're here with this simple trick here, you achieve some time saving. Uh, another example here is, is uh, phasing or changing the, 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 the sequence to have some overlap between design and construction. So if, let's say you're designing the foundation, and then you're excavating the foundation. But there is no really hard constraint between both because really you can start digging uh, until roughly the elevation you expect the design of the foundation to be. Um, so you can start the excavation of the foundation a little earlier than this simple finish to start relationship. And you achieve here also some time savings. So to answer this question also pause the video and then try to think about possible answers. What would be bad things that can happen because of the sequence change that we have seen, that we, we, we did some overlap in between the activities here? What the possible drawbacks of that? So pause, take a moment to think, 
and then we'll we'll come up maybe with some ideas on a scratch paper and we'll, we'll see if this matches with the ideas that or the possible answers that I will share. All right, so hopefully you have some ideas. So one possible drawback here is that it, it increases the criticality of the project. <clears throat> so um, now if I go back to the previous slide, if you think about here, these, this bunch of activities here, these activities here had this float before I accelerated the schedule. But now they have this reduced float. So reducing the float, that translates into increasing the criticality of the project because now uh, a one-day delay here is not a big deal, but one-day delay here is a big deal. It's maybe 50% of the float I have here compared to maybe 25%. So you increase the criticality by doing things in parallel. Um, so that, that's a bad thing. Another thing is it requires more additional coordination because you want to make sure that you're on top of things and you're coordinating things in parallel. So that's more, you know, overloading your uh, management team here. The second approach you can accelerate schedules is by subcontracting. So uh, from resource loading and resource allocation, uh, we learn about how you can uh, load the resources on the activities and can kind of produce that daily estimated need of uh, the number of resources of one maybe labor trade or equipment. Uh, so for example, in the sixth day here, I know that I will need five laborers. And the, and the seventh day, my, my need will increase. So let's say I have a limit here of uh, five uh, laborers. I cannot secure more than that by my company. So I have here in these days, seven, eight, and nine, if I'm not able to secure seven uh, laborers, my project will be delayed because my limit here is five. So I'll push things uh, down the road because I, my capacity is only to provide five laborers. So the way around that is you call another contractor or subcontractor to come and do the work for you. So you subcontract the work due to limited resources. So bad things that can happen from that or the disadvantages. Um, think about it. What's the, what's the bad thing that can happen because you give some of the work to uh, a subcontractor? So one drawback here is you're sharing some of your profit with that subcontractor. So this is a project in progress. So you figure out this need in the middle of the project. You already signed a contract for uh, this project will cost, let's say, a million. Out of this million, you have a, a limited profit for you. Now, when this uh, contractor will come, they will ask for their own profit on the work they will do. So you only added one profit markup but now you will need to account for that additional subcontractor markup on that piece of the work, so that will eat up from your own profit markup. So you have to be willing to give some of your profit markup to others to finish the work for you. And then also, of course, in the middle of the project, bringing a different, a new player, you can say, a new team member, this subcontractor, will be some disruptive. They require some learning curve to come up with the practices and know uh, the other players or team members in the project, so it's a little disruptive. And the, the third and the last approach here to reduce the project uh, duration is crashing the activity duration. Crashing is a little dramatic here, but it's basically reducing the, uh, the duration of a single activity, and probably you want to focus on only the critical activities. Uh, so you fo we focus on the critical activities and make decisions to crash or reduce the uh, activity duration by using one of these possible approaches. So you apply multiple work shifts. So instead of doing one hour, eight hour shift, you do two hour, uh, eight hour shifts. Um, you can apply overtime policy uh, over the weekends or uh, afternoons. Um, you can uh, offer incentives so finishing the work, work earlier. You can allocate additional resources. So instead of using a crew of eight, you might want to use a crew of a 10 or 11 and then you use advanced construction methods uh, with higher productivity so uh, instead of cut and cover maybe you want to think about pipe jacking 
um, um, so or directional piping. So these are advanced techniques that probably comes with additional cost than just the simple cut and cover. Um, so usually these approaches come with additional costs. In addition to these additional costs, decreasing the project duration uh, results in more uh, a couple of inefficiencies that together this additional cost and the inefficiencies will result in increasing the project or the activity cost. Um, so here, when you conceptually, when you um, when you have an activity duration, you want to increase its duration. So you decrease the activity from seven days, let's say, to five days. You expect the cost of finishing this activity to go up. So this relationship here can be linear, can be kind of multi-linear kind of model or step model or non-linear. So there are different ways of doing that. So what, what are the inefficiencies that can we see in, in such cases? First of all, you will find that your workload per person is not balanced. So th those new laborers will come, still the old ones or the core of the crew will still be carrying most of the load. So they, the, you will find some idle time and the additional laborers you include. Um, and then there is also like the idea of adding more laborers to the crew. That's new learners. They need to get you know, to the rhythm of the team and the crew. Um, an additional thing here is the supervisory demand. So uh, most of the uh, trade unions, so if you're working with union uh, uh, trades, unionized trades, uh, uh, then they will require that for every number of apprentices or journeymen, there will be uh, one foreman. So if, you, if your limit is uh, five, uh, to one, meaning that five foremen, five uh, journeymen or uh, apprentices require one foreman. So if you add, let's say, three, uh, you will need two foremen. Even if you're like, you didn't reach the limit of 10 to justify having a, th a second uh, foreman, but you still need to add uh, one foreman because you crossed the first limit of five. So uh, additional supervisory demand is, is a very typical thing for uh, union uh, contractors. And then lastly here, the fatigue. So when you have overtime policy uh, or double shifts, then you will deal with uh, fatigue for sure, or if, especially if you extend that policy for uh, multiple days or, or multiple weeks. So what we'll do is we'll follow the linear approach. So uh, as, as a problem that's given to you in this course, uh, we will, I will give you here these two data points. For an activity, I will provide what's the normal duration and what's the corresponding normal cost, and then how much you can crash this activity to a crash duration and what would be the resulting crash cost. And that will result in a cost slope. So what's the slope of this line? It's basically the difference between the cost of the crash and the normal state divided by the difference between the duration of the crash and the normal state. You can see, of course, here the flip between crash cost and normal duration the, and the, uh, in this uh, fraction or the ratio because the crash cost is higher than the normal cost, but the normal duration is longer than the crash duration. So now if we move from the activity, so we know the time cost relationship in the activity. The more squeeze you do for the activity duration, the increase, the more cost you will incur. Now, if you take that and move move it to the project level, what happens in the project uh, cost and time? So re remember that the project cost equals to direct cost plus indirect cost. And when you do crashing, you increase the activity's direct cost because you crash the activity, it increases to the crash cost uh, instead of normal cost. So that's one thing. But on the other hand, when you re reduce or crash activities if you do it correctly, crashing only the uh, critical activities, that will result in reducing the project duration and that will result in reducing your overhead costs because overhead costs, remember, is almost like a daily cost. So the less days in the project you have, the less indirect costs you have or overhead. So that's the trade-off here. Uh, the more uh, duration you squeeze, the more direct costs you incur 
and it's typically not it's not linear the activity time cost relation is linear but the project direct cost is typically nonlinear the indirect cost is a linear dependent dependency on the duration so the less number of days you have the less indirect cost you have so when you add these two together you end up with the total cost and at some point this will be your optimal duration so you don't want to squeeze it too much you want to want to accelerate the project beyond that point and also you don't want to be too relaxed so there is kind of a sweet spot here so that will be the process for us to analyze or to, or to do that uh, time cost trade-off analysis so first of all you have to determine the normal project duration and normal cost so be by doing um, uh, like the the, uh, the the typical critical path method and adding the uh, like identifying the normal cost and duration for activities also um, so that will be the third step and then the fourth step will be kind of calculating the cost slope for every activity and then the fifth step here is to start crashing the activities that are on the critical path don't pick any activity and just decide on crashing it Focus on the critical path because every day you crash on that path will result in accelerating the project by the same number of days. In case you have multiple activities, then you have to consider both paths now, or three paths, or four, depending on the number you have. On every path, you need to crash this equal number of days. Um, so you need to crash them simultaneously. And then at each uh, crash step, you start re-updating your project cost and duration. And you keep doing that until no further crashing is possible. Meaning that you ended up with uh, a critical path or multiple critical paths um, that there is no further crashing. You already reached uh, the crash duration for all the activities on the critical paths. Once you have these steps of crashing, you can plot now the direct, indirect, and total costs on a, on a chart, and then you can see where is the optimal project duration and cost. So that's a time cost trade-off example that we'll see in, in, the, in, the, in the lecture and when we meet. Uh, so please try to uh, examine this activity. Uh, you can see here that for every activity, I'm providing the maximum crash in, in weeks. And then what will be the crash slope, so the crash cost per unit time. So um, I will we'll see how to solve this example in year and in class. All right, then that's it. So thanks for watching, and we'll see how to solve this example in class. Uh, take care of yourself and those around you.